Hey guys, it's Andre from High Performance Academy here. And in this webinar, we're going to be discussing the piston ring end gaps and how the piston ring end gaps can potentially destroy your engine. Now that's a purposely slightly controversial title. Uh, we're actually going to be discussing a number of other aspects to do with our piston ring end gaps. But this, the reason we've chosen that title is because there is a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding out there uh, in the community in the wider performance industry about the piston ring end gaps and their effect on uh, the reliability of our engine. Uh, most specifically what we're seeing is a lot of pictures posted up of pistons that have been damaged and uh, generally people are jumping to the conclusion that the damage is the result of the piston ring end gap being insufficient, those piston ring end gaps butting together and then causing the damage. So uh, quite often we're seeing photos of a piston that might look something like this. Actually what we'll do is we'll just go to our remote camera here and uh, get a little bit of a close up on that piston. Uh, so this is the sort of photo that we're seeing quite regularly show up as uh, an indication of what uh, could be caused by a piston ring end gap budding together. Now there's certainly no doubt as we'll talk about shortly that insufficient piston ring end gap can cause damage to the piston but more often than not the photos that we are seeing are actually the result of either detonation damage or pre-ignition damage which is the case with this uh, drag racing piston that we've got in front of us. Uh, so you can see pretty catastrophic damage there to the piston. In this case 100% not the cause of of insufficient piston ring end gap. All right, we'll jump back to our main camera now. <coughs> so when we're building a factory motor, refreshing a factory motor with factory components, the piston rings really aren't a component that we need to give too much consideration to. Uh, regardless whether we are rebuilding a factory engine with a stock bore size or we are going to an oversized bore and fitting factory oversized pistons and rings, what we find inevitably is that in most instances the factory rings come pre-gapped. So essentially they're already set for the correct bore diameter and this just means that we need to fit the rings onto the pistons, fit the pistons and rings into the bore and that's about as much as we need to consider uh, with a rebuild on a factory engine. Now when it comes to building a performance engine using aftermarket forged pistons though, uh, this is where we're normally going to be dealing with what's referred to as a file fit piston ring and this is where uh, understanding our piston ring end gaps and how to correctly adjust and set those piston ring end gaps uh, becomes really important. So I guess one of the considerations here is why do we need to uh, adjust the piston ring end gaps. Why are these file fit piston rings uh, in existence? Why don't all of the aftermarket uh, ring manufacturers simply supply the rings with the correct ring end gap so we just can fit them as we would with a factory piston ring? Well the idea here is to allow the engine builder uh, to optimise or select the final ring end gaps to salute their actual application. Uh, so we need to understand what that actually means. Uh, we are the file fit ring gaps, file fit rings I should say, uh, come purposely slightly oversized. So uh, this means that there's going to be insufficient gap between the two ends of the ring if we install the ring straight out of the pack. In some instances they may actually be so large that uh, they actually overlap very slightly. Uh, the aim here is to adjust the ring end gap when we're assembling our engine uh, at room temperature on our bench. We want to adjust the ring end gap so that when the rings expand under operating temperature, when the engine's actually in operation and it's being used hard and that ring is exposed to combustion temperature, we want the ring end gaps under those conditions to be minimal without the risk of those ring end gaps butting together because that uh, can end up causing damage. Now if we can achieve this aim, if we can get our ring end gaps to be minimal in actual operation at our maximum operating uh, temperature or combustion temperature that the engine's going to be running at, that the rings are going to be exposed to, the advantage here is that we minimise the path for uh, combustion gases to escape past the ring and make their way into the crankcase. So uh, there's a few upsides to doing this. First of all it's going to improve our 
ring seal. It's going to allow less leakage past the rings. Uh, so that can result in a small but noticeable improvement in power. Uh, there's various studies by various uh, engine builders uh, that have been performed over the years uh, into what exactly we can expect from uh, optimising our piston ring end gaps. And I'll be honest, it is relatively minor, uh, going from a really large ring end gap in the region of about uh, 45 thousandths of an inch down to a very tight ring gap where we're getting borderline towards uh, butting the rings together, maybe in the range of 18 thou. Uh, you're likely to see a difference in the engine power somewhere in the region of 1 to 2 percent. So it is definitely not a deal breaker in terms of engine performance. However, no one's going to give away free power if it's there for the taking, so that's important to understand. The other aspect to understand though is it's not just power that we're interested in here. If we can minimise that ring end gap, it's going to minimise that combustion pressure leakage past the rings, or in other words, blow by into the crankcase. This is going to uh, mean that our engine is not going to breathe as badly or as heavily uh, as it would with a larger ring end gap. The other aspect there as well is it's been proven to uh, reduce oil consumption. So essentially all of these things obviously are positive factors that we would like to uh, have in our engines if we can. So this is why we have the file fit rings. Our task as the engine builder is to select the correct ring end gap for our particular application and then adjust those ring end gaps to suit. Now in order to understand a little bit more about this we also need to understand what is going to affect the ring gap or uh, what's going to happen to the ring in operation. And essentially the key here is the ring end gap that we need to choose at room temperature when we're assembling the engine is going to depend on the amount of heat that the piston ring is going to be exposed to. It's also going to depend on the material that the ring is made out of. Uh, in other words, the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion of that material. Uh, and it's going to depend, because of the heat factor, uh, there's a few aspects there that will affect the heat that the ring is, is uh, going to be exposed to. Uh, one of the main ones there is the specific power level that the engine is producing. So what I mean by this is if we take a relatively basic naturally aspirated engine and we compare that to uh, a fairly heavily modified boosted engine, maybe a turbocharged engine running high boost, uh, what we've got in the high boost turbocharged engine is that we are combusting a lot more fuel and air molecules inside the combustion chamber. We are forcing a lot more air and fuel into the cylinder. We're creating a bigger combustion event. This is where we are getting the additional power and torque from uh, with the turbocharged engine, but the byproduct of this is that we are creating more heat than a low power naturally aspirated engine. So this is one aspect, as the specific power level of our engine increases, uh, we, need, we know that that is going to produce more heat, it's going to expose the rings to more heat, and we need to take that into account when we're selecting our ring end gaps. The other aspect there is the fuel that we are running on, this will also have an effect on the uh, uh, combustion temperatures. So for example if we're running an engine on a pump gasoline uh, this is going to create a lot more combustion temperature than perhaps an alcohol based fuel such as E85 or even methanol which is very popular in drag racing applications. So uh, what this means is all things being equal if we are running an engine on an alcohol based fuel uh, we're going to be exposing the rings to a little bit less combustion temperature and this in turn would allow us to to reduce the ring end gaps very marginally. Uh, the last aspect here that I'll cover off is also the usage of the engine. So uh, this really comes down to how much uh, high power sustained use the engine is going to be placed under. So on the low end of that scale we've got our everyday road cars. So uh, in a road car, unless you're uh, lucky enough to live in a part of the world where you have access to an autobahn or a motorway that's non-speed restricted, uh, if you value your license it's pretty difficult to stay at wide open open throttle for more than maybe 6 to 8 seconds, maybe 8 to 10 seconds uh, without really uh, getting to the point where you're risking getting thrown straight in jail. 
So this also in turn limits the amount of uh, heat that is going to be be transferred into the rings. So uh, when we compare this to maybe a circuit car where the engine is going to be run hard under sustained wide open throttle operation, lap after lap for uh, maybe 30, 40 minutes on end, maybe an endurance application hours on end, understandably the amount of heat that the rings are going to be exposed to uh, is much higher. So these are the sort of aspects that we need to take into account when we are trying to decide uh, on the correct ring gap for our particular engine. Now we're not left of course to our own devices here, uh, we don't need to just come up with the ring end gaps uh, by guesswork, we are guided here and uh, one of the ways we're guided is by the recommendations from the ring manufacturer. Uh, so let's just jump across to our little remote camera again and uh, this is the recommendations from JE for the ring pack that was supplied with our Subaru FA20 piston rings. So this is pretty typical of what we'll see from most manufacturers and I just want to talk about the information that we've got here on this sheet. On the left hand side we have listed the application, so for example we have high performance street and strip and below this we have street moderate turbo nitrous. Next we've got a, our recommended ring gaps for our top ring and our second ring. Uh, you'll note that these are listed as minimum gap per inch of bore. So if we just look at these two top examples here for our top ring, for a high performance street and strip the recommendation is 0.0045 inch or four and a half thousandths of an inch per inch of bore and for a turbo or nitrous application you can see that that increases very slightly to uh, five thousandths of an inch per inch of bore. Now the other aspect here, we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, is our second ring. We can see that the recommendations for our second ring end gaps are very slightly larger than for our top ring gaps. So as I say we'll talk about that in more detail. And then finally we have a recommendation for our oil rail rings. Uh, these though are not uh, a clearance per inch of board, these are just a minimum so all we want to do here with our oil ra ring rails is just make sure that the minimum end gap is at least 15 thousandths of an inch, these don't have any effect on the compression of the engine so they're much less important. Ok so let's just talk about how exactly that works, so we know that we need for a high performance street strip application there uh, we're looking at a uh, minimum end gap of four and a half thousandths of an inch per inch of bore. So what we're going to do there is simply take the bore diameter that we're using, so let's just jump to our overhead camera here and we'll go through a calculation and what we're going to do is take a 3.386 uh, a inch bore and we're going to, going to multiply that by 0 0.0045 and what that does is it gives us a recommended ring gap for our top ring of 0 0.015 of an inch or in other words 15 thousandths of an inch, in this case 15.2 thousandths if we want to be really fussy. Uh, generally we want to err on the side of caution here when we're talking about our ring end gaps as well. Uh, so if we're getting quite close uh, to maybe 15.3, 15.4 uh, thousandths of an inch recommendation uh, we would probably be safest to actually increase that and go to 16 thousandths of an inch rather than 15 thousandths of an inch so uh, it's difficult to really work much more accurately than 1 thousandths of an inch so uh, that's generally a good guide there. Now the recommendations there though from our manufacturer are generally also a little bit on the cautious side so in this particular instance if I saw 15.2 as my calculated end gap uh, I'd be quite comfortable setting that to 15 thousandths of an inch, I know that that's going to be uh, quite safe. Uh, the ring manufacturer clearly doesn't want any chance of uh, the rings budding in use and causing damage to the engine so their recommendations are always going to be uh, a little bit on the large side there. Uh, so if you don't know any better these are obviously uh, the the sort of recommendations that we need to follow. Now you'll notice there that the second ring end gap was specified to be half a thousandth of an inch per inch of bore larger than the top ring. 
Now, on face value, that doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Remember, we're talking here about the heat that's being, uh, the ring is being exposed to. That's going to dictate how much the ring is going to expand at operating temperature. And clearly, the top ring is a lot closer to that combustion heat than the second ring. So hence, it doesn't make a lot of sense that the ring manufacturer is specifying a larger ring end gap for the second ring than for the top ring. So the second ring is going to be running colder, it's not going to expand so much. And probably uh, a few decades ago, the actual technique or the general, uh, generally accepted trend was to gap the second ring tighter than the top ring for this very reason. Uh, this has been a more recent changeover uh, and the reason for this is that study and testing found uh, that if our second ring end gap was tight than our top ring end gap. What we can find is that even with our top ring gap uh, optimally set, we are still inevitably going to end up with some blow by, some combustion pressure escaping past that top ring. And if our second ring end gap is also quite tight, what that combustion pressure can do is actually build up between the top ring and the second ring. And when this happens, it can destabilise that top ring, and this has the effect of massively reducing our ring seal. So uh, we end up with a really large drop off in our ring seal, and that's really detrimental to our engine performance. So this is why the second ring end gap is specified as being slightly larger uh, than our top ring end gap. Now, we've talked about the uh, recommendations there uh, and we've talked about the general theory we obviously want to try and achieve the tightest ring end gap that we possibly can uh, to optimize our horsepower uh, to minimize our blow by and reduce our uh, oil consumption so that's all of the upsides of getting our ring end gap optimal and we now have talked also about the fact that the correct ring end gap is going to depend on the heat that that ring is exposed to. Now the downside though is if we go too far what can happen is that as the ring expands in operation the two ends of the ring can butt together and when that happens there's really nowhere for that ring to continue expanding uh, so this can result in some really severe damage to our engine. Uh, first of all we essentially can have the ring seize in the bore so it's going to end up damaging the uh, cylinder wall. Uh, the other aspect is that it can essentially rip the crown off the piston. So uh, this is the sort of damage that is often uh, mistaken for the detonation damage that we looked at. So we're not going to see uh, melting on our piston like this, but if we see large chunks of our ring lands broken out, uh, maybe the actual crown ripped off the piston, and in very severe circumstances, essentially what's going to happen is that the connecting rod will pull uh, the wrist pin out of the bottom of the piston and then obviously the conrod exits the side of the block. Uh, that sort of damage is more in line with what we're expecting to see if our ring end gaps are too tight. So uh, clearly if we want to err on one side or the other of our optimal point, it's always safest to go a little bit larger in our ring end gap uh, than too tight. Uh, we're going to see a very minimal drop off in our power that probably most people aren't even going to be worried about, a slight increase in our blow by and a very slight increase in our oil consumption but that's obviously uh, by far the pr preferable situation compared to uh, the area where our ring end gaps butt together and actually cause catastrophic engine damage. Okay, so once we've actually selected the ring end gaps that we want to run, uh, we need to find out what our ring end gaps are to start with, and then we can make adjustments. So we're going to go through and have a look at that process now. So for this uh, example here, I've got half of a Subaru FA20 engine, and what we're going to do is take our ring, in this case we've got one of our top rings, and we're going to place that in our bore. Uh, so we'll just jump to our overhead camera here and have a look at this process. Now I've just located the ring down in the bore there, but this isn't where we want to actually make our measurement. What we want to do is make sure that our ring is square in the bore, so in other words an equal distance down from the top of the bore. And we also want to locate it a little way down the bore. So in order to do that I'm just going to use a piston ring squaring tool. Uh, so I'm just going to place that on the top of the ring here 
and just allow it to expand out gently. I'm just going to push that down and it has little pockets cut into it which will locate on the top of the bore and that makes sure that our ring is located the correct distance down the bore uh, and is square to the top of the bore. Now when we do this one of the really important aspects to note is the ring end gap and whether it's parallel. So if we jump to our remote camera for a second, in this case you can see that the ring end gap is actually pretty square. So what we're looking for is to make sure that the ring end gap is parallel from the inside uh, to the outside there. That's really important. If that ring end gap is not parallel, we're going to need to correct that uh, during the ring gapping process. So when we're actually uh, adjusting our ring end gap, we're going to need to adjust the ring end gap so that it, it is, in tr is truly parallel. So once we've got our ring there, we have taken note of whether or not uh, that ring end gap is parallel. What we're going to do is take a set of feeler blades and we're going to use these to measure our existing ring gap. A uh, really, really cheap uh, piece of equipment that most mechanics should already have access to. So to start with what I'll do is I'll take our 12 thou feeler blade and I'm just going to slip that down through that ring end gap. At the moment there's absolutely no resistance so I know that our ring end gap is already larger than 12 thou. Uh, we'll jump up and we'll go to 14 thousandths of an inch here and we'll just check that. So with our 14th hour, we've got just the right amount of tension. So we know right now our ring end gap is sitting at 14 thousandths of an inch. Now remember we wanted to set our ring end gaps to 15 thou. Uh, so we now know that we need to remove a little bit of material. We want to set our ring end gap to 15 thou. We need to increase it by 1 thousandths of an inch. Now the way we're going to do this is we're going to use a piston ring file. Now there's a couple of options when it comes to piston ring files. Uh, here on our bench we have an electric ring file. This is a Total Seal Piston Rings product. Uh, we've also got behind our desk here, uh, we've got a much cheaper manual ring file. So I'm going to demonstrate uh, the process on our electric ring file. But we'll also talk about how the manual ring file can be used because particularly for those of you who are maybe just getting started in engine building, maybe you're only going to build one or two engines. It doesn't make a lot of sense, I should say. Uh, spending a huge amount of money on a very elaborate piece of equipment that you're not going to get value out of. So what we'll do now is we'll just have a look here at our uh, piston ring file and I'll explain some of the aspects of the ring file. So uh, these are available from a range of different manufacturers. Uh, one of the nice functions with the the ring file we've got here is that it does use a dial indicator. Uh, so this allows us to zero the dial indicator and we can be a little bit more accurate with how much material we are removing from the ring. The other aspect here is that the bed that the ring sits on also has an adjustable stop. Now this allows us to set essentially the bore diameter that we are going to be using for our ring file and this makes sure that we uh, can keep our ring end gaps square or parallel which I was talking about earlier. Uh, particularly when we are gapping a lot of rings for uh, one engine this allows us to keep good consistency across all of our rings. So what we can do is locate the ring in the file, we just want the end to protrude slightly past the table there and then what we can do is bring that ring down and there's a thumb wheel on the end of our ring file and we just can turn that until we're just barely contacting uh, the grinding wheel. At this point we can zero our dial gauge so what I'll do now is we'll just turn our ring file on and I'm just going to remove a small amount of material. So when we're removing material here what we want to do is just move that ring file down against the abrasive wheel. Uh, once we've got it squared away we can remove we can turn the thumb wheel and what we want to do is just remove around about half a thou to one thou of material uh, in each cut. If we make a really large adjustment to our ring that's going to have the potential to damage it. Now even with a dial gauge on our ring file like we've got here, we always want to make small adjustments to our ring end gaps uh, and then check our progress. Uh, it's really easy to find that we haven't taken enough material off and we can simply increase 
increase uh, the ring gap further by grinding a little bit more material. But if we go too far, uh, that can end up requiring us to buy a new set of rings which can waste money and it can also waste time uh, if we are ordering parts from overseas. So it's always best to creep up on the correct ring gap slowly but surely. Now if you are going to be using the manual ring file this requires a little bit more care. Uh, so in terms of price we're talking here about a, a product that's somewhere in the region of about three to four hundred US dollars. Uh, these manual ring files can be purchased for uh, somewhere in the region of about 40 to 50 US dollars or even cheaper. So as I say, a much uh, more cost effective option for those who are going to only be uh, grinding a few rings or building a few engines. The problem with the manual ring file is they do require a little bit more care as I've mentioned. Uh, in particular, one of the aspects that we need to be aware of is that it is possible to rotate the handle that, it, that turns the grinding wheel in either direction. And we always want to make sure that when we are adjusting our ring end gaps, when we are grinding a ring, we want to grind from the outside of the ring to the inside. A lot of the modern rings that we are going to be using will have an inlay on the outer surface of the ring. And if we grind from the inside to the outside of the ring, uh, this can grab and pull that inlay out of the ring and destroy it. So uh, that's the first tip. So what we want to do is locate the ring on the bed and you can see we have a couple of little locating dowels here. Another common mistake is a lot of people think that uh, they want to locate the ring uh, and squeeze it together against the grinding wheel and grind both sides of the ring together. It's definitely not the way we want to use this. We only want to grind one side of the ring and in fact if we do that, if we uh, grab that ring and squeeze it together and grind both sides we're going to end up uh, with a ring end gap that's uh, excessive and it's also only going to be parallel uh, when the ring end gap is the same width as our grinding wheel so definitely not how we want to use that. Uh, however with a little bit of care, a little bit of patience and a little bit of time uh, you definitely can get good results uh, from one of these manual ring files. Uh, the point here is if you are considering uh, maybe a career building engines or maybe you're thinking of building a number of engines or you're running a shop and you want to start doing your own engine assembly, uh, the cost of a, an electric ring file can quickly uh, pay for itself because uh, they allow you to grind the rings much more quickly. Uh, they also allow you to do a much more consistent job uh, across the entire uh, set of rings for an engine so it allows you to do a much better job. One last aspect once we have set our ring end gaps is that depending on how much material we are removing from the ring uh, we're likely to end up with a small burr on the ring where we've ground it. Uh, so we can remove that or we want to remove that before the rings are installed on the piston and what we want to do here is use a very fine needle file. Uh, now we're only going to be adjust, uh, only going to be filing that burr off the side of the ring that we have just ground and all we want to do is just gently run that needle file against the edge of the ring and we just want to break down that burr. Uh, we don't want to be chamfering the edge of the ring, uh, it should only take a couple of uh, attempts to remove that burr and make sure that uh, the edge still remains nice and sharp so that's really important as well. Uh, now We've talked here about the basic recommendations that we're likely to get from our piston ring manufacturer. I've already said that these are likely to be a little bit on the conservative side because the ring manufacturer definitely doesn't want those ring end gaps butting in use. So uh, we're going to be absolutely safe and generally there's, there's nothing wrong with going with the recommendations. Uh, if we are building an engine where we really want every last possible horsepower out of that engine and then there can be some advantage to come from adjusting and optimizing the rings for your absolute uh, application so uh, this is particularly important if you're running in a controlled class where uh, the uh, limitations on what you can do to the engine are quite drastic uh, here we really need to optimize every single aspect of the engine and getting that ring end gap optimized is one area where we can do this. Now this is difficult to do unless you are dealing with the same engine repeatedly uh, and you're seeing that engine come back in after it's been run hard in service and you're stripping that engine down and expecting it, inspecting it to see how it's wearing. Uh, 
Uh, if you are doing this, it gives you the opportunity to see uh, what those ring end gaps are looking like and whether there's potential uh, that you may be able to tighten the ring end gaps. So this is a scenario I went through with our Mitsubishi 4G63 drag engine program. Uh, we were building multiple engines for our own use as well as a lot of our 4G63 drag customers and uh, predominantly we were running on the same fuel, similar power levels and uh, similar piston and ring designs and what we could do there is uh, build the engine, send it out and when it came back in we were able to inspect the ring. Uh, what we're looking for here is any sign that the ring has been butting in operation. So obviously as we've already found out if the ring uh, has been severely butting in operation you're going to know about it straight away uh, because the engine's going to be uh, severely damaged. Uh, before we get to that point though there will be some uh, slight signs that that's what's going on and what we're going to be doing here is uh, inspecting the edges of our ring end gaps. And what we're looking for is a polished appearance to our ring end gap. If we're getting that polished appearance, that's the very first indicator that our rings are starting to butt together. And that's a clear warning that we've gone too far. And in fact, we then need to increase our ring end gap by a couple of thousandths of an inch. If we've got no sign of that butting though, if there's no polished appearance there, uh, and we are understanding the risks involved and prepared to take them, uh, then we can then re build the engine with a new ring set and reduce that ring end gap slightly. Obviously uh, we're not going to want to go and make massive adjustments here, we don't want to reduce that ring end gap by four or five thousandths of an inch, we'd be uh, making adjustments in the order of a thousandths of an inch or uh, thereabouts. And over the course of several uh, engine builds and teardowns we start to get a feel for uh, what is optimal for our particular application. Okay, we're going to move into some questions and answers really shortly, so if you do have any questions uh, on ring end gaps, uh, anything that I've talked about today that you'd like me to go into more detail on, uh, please ask those in the chat or in the comments and uh, the guys will transfer those through to me and I'll answer them very shortly. Now before we move into the questions though, uh, there's this is only one factor here that we're looking at that affects our ring seal or our blow by past our ring. So it's really important not to uh, put too much emphasis on the ring end gaps being the be all and end all when it comes to ring seal. Uh, by far the most important factor is to make sure uh, that we're actually starting with uh, a perfect bore finish. So uh, that's going to give the rings the best possible chance of sealing against the cylinder walls. So uh, this involves making sure that our cylinders are perfectly round, uh, that they are perfectly parallel from the top to the bottom uh, of the cylinder. And we also want the correct hone pattern uh, and finish on the bores to give the rings the best possible chance of bedding in. Uh, there are some other factors as well to do with the uh, rings and how they sit on the piston. So uh, in particular uh, what we're looking for here is uh, the correct clearance between the ring and the ring groove. So uh, there's two clearances there to consider. Uh, first of all we have the side clearance which is essentially uh, the up and down clearance between the ring and the ring groove and also the back clearance. So it's really important to uh, make sure that there is sufficient back clearance with our ring in the ring groove and when the ring is all the way back in the groove it actually should sit uh, slightly uh, below the surface of the piston there. Now this is an area and particularly the side clearance this is an area that where there has been uh, quite a lot of development goes into uh, very high end race engines. Uh, essentially what we're seeing there is uh, rings being produced that are getting thinner and thinner. Uh, the advantage of a thinner ring is that it allows it to uh, deform a little bit easier to any irregularities in the cylinder wall uh, but just as importantly it also reduces the frictional loss from the actual ring scraping up and down against the bore walls in operation. Uh, the problem with going to a thinner ring is that it will run a lot hotter and it's the uh, contact essentially between the ring and the ring groove in the piston uh, that will reduce the heat or transfer the heat out of the ring. Uh, when we go to very very thin rings what we actually find is uh, you can get problems with micro welding between the ring and the ring groove. Uh, so this is where a lot of piston manufacturers are now offering uh, treatments such as hard anodizing of the ring grooves uh, to prevent that 
uh, localized welding and this also allows the clearance between the ring and the ring groove to be tightened up as well. All of this is aiding uh, the potential for that ring to do its job properly and seal. Uh, the other aspect that can affect our ring seal is uh, the uh, condition of the engine. So what I'm talking about here is uh, engines that have maybe not had regular oil changes. Uh, what we can find is that we'll get a varnish build up or a sludge build up uh, on the and behind the rings and this can uh, affect the ability of the rings to seal properly. So uh, there is a lot more to it than just ring end gap as with uh, anything to do with engine building. Uh, there's a lot of things going on here inside our engine and we need to make sure for optimal performance that everything is uh, op operating correctly, all of the clearances are optimal and if we can do that we're going to get an engine that's going to offer us uh, the best performance possible. So I guess really to uh, just reiterate that first point, the, the really the, the title of this webinar uh, that ring end gaps can cause uh, failure of your engine, well yes as we've discussed absolutely if your ring end gaps are too tight then yes you're definitely risking a potential and catastrophic engine failure. The reality though is that with 16 years in the industry uh, most of that spent building very high performance engines as opposed to everyday road car engines, uh, this is a, a failure mode that I almost never have seen. Uh, short of someone really stuffing up and not understanding uh, what they're doing and set setting those ring end gaps too tight, it is definitely not as common as uh, a lot of people in the industry would like you to think. Uh, and of course then as we've seen as well uh, a lot of the failures that people are touting on the internet uh, as a result of a ring end gap that's too tight are actually more often than not the result of either detonation or pre-ignition damage. The last thing I want to touch on here before we jump into questions is uh, the break-in process because this is really important as well when we're talking about ring seal. Uh, this really doesn't relate specifically to our ring end gap but it is related to the aspect of ring seal. Uh, when we are breaking in a freshly built engine there's a lot of misunderstanding or misinformation about what we're actually trying to achieve and uh, a lot of people think that we are running in the bearings against the journals of the crankshaft. Of course that's not the case if we uh, are getting any metal to metal contact between the crankshaft journals and the engine bearings that's going to result in uh, engine damage and no amount of gentle running in is going to fix that. The journals of course should be supported uh, by a film of oil and there should never be any direct contact with the bearing surface itself. Uh, there's also a lot of misunderstanding about uh, the fact that we need to heat cycle the engine. I think this comes from uh, the terminology heat treatment. A lot of the components uh, that go into the engine are heat treated but of course uh, the heat treatment treatment process is achieved at much higher operating temperatures or higher temperatures I should say than what our engine operates at. So really the key aspect when we come to engine break-in is what we're really trying to focus on is uh, to bed the rings against the cylinder walls. So uh, we're using that fresh hone pattern that is on the cylinder walls uh, to basically grind down against the ring and get the ring seated properly against the cylinder walls so that they can do the best job possible of sealing. And uh, this requires a an approach that needs to be reasonably specific, although we're quite lucky these days because uh, modern honing techniques combined with the modern rings that we have access to now, uh, we almost need to try pretty hard in order to uh, mess up the, the running in process. But still I don't like to take any chances so so uh, I always religiously go through the same process because it has never let me down. Uh, the first point is we want to always start with a mineral based oil in the engine. Uh, some of the modern full synthetic oils are so slippery that they actually can uh, stop the rings from bedding in correctly so that's really important. There are specific running in oils available as well. I've used those in the past but generally in my experience they are exceptionally thin and uh, generally because I am building high, high performance engines, uh, even during the running in or break in process the engines are generally producing relatively high specific power levels so uh, I like the protection from a slightly thicker good quality mineral based oil. 
Then what we want to do is understand what's happening during the combustion process. When we go through the combustion process, we actually have the combustion pressure getting in behind that top ring and forcing it out against the cylinder wall. And that's what we really want to have happening in order to make sure that our rings are going to bed properly. So it's really important not to baby a freshly built engine. What we actually want to do is apply uh, a moderate amount of load to get those rings forced out against the cylinder wall and make sure that they bed against that fresh home pattern. We've actually got a relatively limited time frame with which to get our rings bed in before that home pattern is smoothed out. Uh, generally this happens within about the first 100 kilometres of use. Uh, we get about 85% of our ring bedding is done in that first 100 kilometres. By the time we've got to about 200 kilometres of use, uh, really that's it, we're done and uh, no amount of, of gentle running beyond that is going to have any effect on our on our ring seal. Uh, essentially our engine is completely run in around about 200 kilometres of use. Uh, beyond that it's basically running out so you might as well get some enjoyment out of it and make the most of it. Uh, so these people who are recommending 1,000 or 2,000 kilometres of light running uh, for running in their engine, it's simply not necessary and often more detrimental. So what we want to do is use periods of light or moderate load, uh, so part throttle, a little bit of throttle, a little bit of boost if we're talking about a turbocharged car to force that ring out against the wall. And then we also want to back off and go back to light load and this allows the ring to cool down because obviously there's a lot of friction there against that coarse uh, fresh home pattern. So we want to cycle between uh, s sort of periods of moderate load and then backing off and allow the engine, the rings to cool back down. Uh, so I just do this on the dyno, uh, I'll run between maybe three and 4,000 RPM, uh, cycle slightly into the throttle, maybe 30 to 40% throttle, and then back off. And I do this over a period of perhaps an hour, and as I progress, I increase both the amount of load as well as the amount of RPM that I'm using. Uh, so that's the process I use. I'm certainly not advocating going straight to the rev limiter and full power, uh, but definitely allowing the engine to idle hot for long periods of time when it's freshly built uh, can also be uh, just as dangerous. Uh, I almost forgot as well one more uh, aspect that I just want to talk about here uh, is a, uh, ring s a ring system that we used uh, in some of our drag engines. Uh, this is a ring from Total Seal, so I've got it here, we'll just go to our remote camera, hopefully you'll be able to see this. Uh, so these are called a Total Seal gapless ring, and the gapless ring uh, is actually a two-piece ring, so uh, as its name implies, it, when it's installed in the engine, it has essentially no gap. So we'll just remove the two parts. So uh, what we have is a stepped ring and what we want to do is once the uh, ring is installed, so in this case we will still have a ring gap as you can see there, uh, but it's much less critical because when the ring's installed we also uh, install this little rail which sits on the step. Uh, we locate the gap for the rail uh, 180 degrees opposite to our uh, top ring gap, or the other part of the ring gap, and this gives no direct path for combustion pressure to uh, get past the ring. Um, I've used these, they do give uh, really good results, particularly if you're doing a compression test or a leak down test. Uh, if you compare the results from a gapless ring uh, to a conventional gapped ring, uh, they're always far, far superior. Uh, in reality though, uh, I don't see a significant difference in terms of the actual power that we are seeing on the dyno. Uh, one of the reasons I did use these gapless rings in our high boost turbocharged engines, uh, particularly if we aren't running dry sump lubrication is it does massively reduce the blow by gases into the combustion uh, into the crankcase and uh, in turn in a high boost application this is going to result in the engine uh, breathing less so uh, when we're talking about engines running 40, 50 or 60 psi of boost without a dry sump system uh, it can be really difficult to stop the engine from essentially pumping oil out the breather and filling a catch can uh, during a pass on the drag strip so these gapless rings are a uh, benefit there. The other aspect with the total seal gapless rings in my own experience is that they do tend to have uh, fairly low limited lifespan, so uh, perfectly okay for uh, drag applications, but uh, possibly not quite I so ideal for circuit racing or a street engine. Okay, we'll move into some questions and answers now. Of course, if you do have any other questions, uh, please ask them and I will be happy to try and answer them. 
Um, our first question comes from uh, Falah, who's asked, are rings for any type of cylinders? I've got an Audi with factory oil consumption problem. Uh, also, should I just change the rings or get a fresh set of pistons with the rings? Uh, no, uh, you do need to be a little bit careful here. Uh, the rings do need to be matched to uh, the bore material. So uh, predominantly here we are dealing with uh, most engines run a cast iron uh, sleeve or a cast iron block entirely. Uh, so a lot of the rings that we see are designed to work on this cast iron material. Uh, very, very rare, but there are uh, other cylinder uh, bore materials which won't work with our conventional rings. Uh, also there is a coating process uh, such as Nicosil which is applied directly on uh, aluminium so it allows the rings to run against the aluminium without wearing them. So uh, for some of these special uh, bore uh, materials then you do need to be aware that they do need to be run with a certain uh, ring material. Uh, you'd need to talk to your piston and ring manufacturer about that. Uh, I cannot advise you unfortunately further than that. Um, Chad has asked if you turbocharge a high comp compression naturally aspirated engine and simply freshen it up, would you recommend running a slightly larger ring gap than the manufacturer? Okay, this is a question that I've actually had a few times and uh, in my own experience generally we don't need to adjust the ring gaps. Now, the reason for this is generally if we're running a naturally aspirated compression ratio and we've turbocharged the engine, uh, what we're going to find is that while yes we are producing more power, uh, there's a limit to how much boost we're going to be able to run on that engine uh, before we start getting to a position where uh, we run into problems with detonation. So there's a very uh, real ceiling to essentially how much uh, we can push a naturally aspirated uh, piston or a naturally aspirated engine when we add a turbocharger to it. Uh, the flip side of this is that uh, we obviously can run on a better grade of fuel such as E85. We're doing exactly this on our Subaru FA20 uh, and we're at approximately double the factory power level uh, measured at the wheels on our mainline dyno, running about 8 psi of boost using a Borg Warner turbocharger on E85. Uh, we are still running the complete stock factory engine uh, complete with the factory ring end gaps. Now, the reason for this is there with the E85 we tend to run a little bit cooler. Uh, so we're still within the margin of safety that the manufacturer has uh, provided us. Now obviously uh, that's not a blanket uh, sort of solution. There may be some situations where uh, we're really pushing uh, a factory engine really hard. Some particular engines that may be up to uh, taking a, a huge amount of uh, power over and above what they're designed for. If that's the case then yes certainly it would be worth considering adjusting those ring gaps. Uh, TD Champs uh, asks what's the best way to measure the back clearance. I mean generally this can be done uh, essentially visually. If we look at our uh, ring manufacturer's specifications here, uh, we have actually got uh, some specifications here on both the minimum back clearance, in this case uh, we're looking at uh, half a thou, uh, sorry five thou I should say, and uh, in the, the side clearance as well. Uh, so this is something that uh, generally if we're purchasing new products, new pistons, new rings, these are all designed to work together uh, and we can at least check the back clearance here uh, just visually. So so uh, if we hold the piston up to the light and we drop the ring into the groove, uh, we're going to be able to see that it does sit down below the surface. So uh, that's about as uh, elaborate as we're going to be able to get uh, short of having some really specific measurement equipment there. Uh, again, in my experience, uh, from sort of 16 years now in the industry building performance engines uh, unless we are mixing and matching parts that were never designed to work together uh, this really is seldom uh, an actual issue. Uh, the side clearance between the uh, the piston ring and the ring groove uh, can be a consideration we need to check uh, if we are rebuilding an engine which has had a lot of use uh, this can loosen up and uh, also if we've got a piston that has been exposed to detonation we can get the reverse scenario where the ring groove is actually tightened so it's actually one of the aspects I always recommend checking when we uh, dis disassemble an engine is to make sure that the ring is still 100% free in the ring groove uh, if there is a problem there we want to catch that pretty early on. Um, 
Uh, Mariano has asked, I'm just getting ready to put together my Mitsubishi uh, 6G72 performance engine, looking for 650 horsepower. Uh, now my question would be, is there a happy medium uh, ring gap that would allow me to happily run that power and yet have a reliable daily driver without having too much blow by? Uh, look, if you're if you're sort of building a 6G72, it's a relatively uh, large capacity engine, so 650 horsepower is certainly uh, not outside of the realms of uh, reality for that engine so I don't believe at that point uh, a compromise is really uh, needed at all. Uh, I would be probably looking depending on your specific ring obviously I can't give you specifics here because every ring uh, is a little bit different in terms of its material so you still need to base your decision uh, on the ring manufacturer's uh, recommendations but uh, in this case uh, if we're looking at our JE Pistons uh, recommendations here uh, I'd be looking at somewhere in the region of about five thousandths of an inch per inch of bore for our top ring that's going to be uh, probably pretty safe if you're running that engine on pump gasoline there. Uh, Dylan has asked how can a ring gap become too tight? Uh, it's not going to become too tight, it's only going to be too tight uh, as a fact of it has not been, uh, you haven't given it enough clearance during the assembly process so uh, as the ring wears, as the bore wears essentially we're going to find that that ring end gap will marginally open up if anything uh, so we're not going to end up with the ring gap uh, being okay at one point and then becoming too tight so uh, that's not a situation there that's going to be an issue. Um, he's asked uh, is the tool to square the ring in the cylinder you showed during this webinar a universal tool uh, or is the many size available regarding the bore of the engine you're using? Okay so I uh, probably didn't really focus on that enough so this ring squaring tool that I am using is universal so uh, essentially you just compress it and uh, you can adjust it for any bore diameter. Uh, now these probably are a tool that you should be considering purchasing because they're cheap as chips. I think uh, these are in the region of about 10 US dollars. You can buy them on eBay, you can buy them on uh, Summit or Jig, so really no reason not to have one. Uh, however, if you don't have one, an alternative solution here, which I was going to show, uh, we've got one of our pistons here. This only will work if you've got a flat top piston. And what I've done is I've installed the second ring on the piston. So what we can do now is we can actually drop that piston into the bore upside down, press it down against the ring that we've got in the bore, and push it down until that second ring just locates on the top of the bore. So that's going to again make sure that our ring is located down the bore the correct amount and it's squared correctly in the in the uh, bore. Uh, again it won't work if you've got uh, a domed piston that where the dome is going to interfere with the ring though. Uh, Wally's asked, uh, so essentially race application of fuel will get you a gap window and then your gap will be proportional to your power, uh, combustion force and temperature. Uh, yeah that's probably a pretty good way of, of looking at it really. Um, yeah in a nutshell that's that sort of sums up what we're looking at here. Uh, our next question comes from Lucas who's asked, um, high correct gaps for E85 fuel. Uh, I'm not quite sure there if I'm sort of deciphering that correctly. Uh, I think uh, Lucas is asking uh, do we need to increase our ring gaps for E85 fuel and uh, generally not. that's not the case but we do need to be a little bit cautious of this information as well. So all things being equal if we take an engine that's producing let's say 600 horsepower on pump gasoline and we went to E85 at that same power level we're actually going to be producing less uh, combustion temperatures. We're going to be pulling less heat into the rings uh, than we were on pump gasoline. However one of the reasons and obviously that in, in itself would entail that we don't need our ring end gaps to be as large. However one of the reasons that most people will go to E85 is so that they can increase the boost uh, and push the engine harder and as we do that we can end up with our combustion temperatures being the same or higher than on pump gasoline. So again it becomes a factor of uh, your actual, all of your uh, at all of the uh, factors taken into account and considered. Uh, Donald has asked how many engine hours do you reckon would complete the break-in process? Uh, so for us on the engine dyno or the chassis dyno we were running the engine for a, approximately one hour and then we would uh, perform an oil change, we would get rid of the running in oil, uh, we'd also change the oil filter because during that initial break-in period we are getting a lot of the assembly lube, uh, silicons uh, and bore scrapings from that running in process uh, getting into the oil so we 
want to get rid of that relatively quickly. Uh, so beyond that, beyond about uh, 100 kilometers of use, I'd consider the engine run in uh, well enough to continue with the tuning process and start pushing it hard. Um, AJ has asked, uh, what determines the ring end, end size and also is there a specific alignment for the rings, meaning if they should be 180 to each other. Uh, okay, so I think we've talked about the ring, I think you're talking the ring end gap there. We've talked about some of the factors there that determine that ring end gap and we've talked about uh, the fact that uh, there is a specification there from the manufacturer that we can work with. Uh, yes, there is also a specification for where our ring end gaps should be aligned. So uh, let's just see if I can show this here again on our JE uh, ring information so let's just jump across to our remote camera and uh, this is basically looking down on the top of the piston and we can see that uh, we've got our location for our top compression ring end gap, our second compression ring end gap. So you can see that these are 180 degrees opposed. So basically we're giving the com combustion pressure the least possible chance of going straight through there. Uh, we've also got uh, our oil ring expanded gap range and our oil ring rail uh, gaps. So uh, this is how we want to set up our piston, uh, our rings on our pistons when we are installing them. However, it is also important to to uh, make sure, or to understand I should say, that these rings do tend to rotate uh, in operation. So the rings actually do move while the engine is operating, so uh, they aren't going to stay put, uh, but we always want to align them at least to start with, give ourselves the best chance of having them in the correct location. Uh, James has asked, uh, LS with factory rings, what would be a, ring, a good ring gap for a 350 shot of nitrous? Uh, it's a pretty decent shot of nitrous. Uh, you will quite often uh, get uh, a... Uh, quite a large window here. So, what I'm what I mean by this is there's a number of people that have run uh, turbochargers on uh, absolutely stock LS engines uh, and found that uh, there's no need to increase the ring end gap. Uh, so, there's a number of cases of people producing 800 plus horsepower uh, at the wheels using a stock LS short block uh, fitted with a turbocharger and uh, being absolutely fine. So, uh, a lot of it again comes down to the fuel that you're running on so there is uh, a little bit more to consider than just the fact you're adding a 350 shot of nitrous. Uh, in particular with the nitrous what we do find is the cooling nature uh, of the nitrous helps again there uh, and we've got the the factory ring end gap is uh, still going to give quite a large buffer there. So uh, straight out of the factory, their ring end gaps aren't exactly right on the uh, the small side. They're not right on the limit for that factory engine. So as soon as we essentially add any power adders, increase the power level, uh, we're not going to have our rings butt together. Uh, so what I would do there is uh, basically have a uh, inspection and see where the ring gaps were. Uh, it certainly wouldn't hurt if the engine is a part two increase the ring end gap uh, maybe, by, maybe by somewhere in the region of half a thou per inch of bore uh, if you know that you are building it with forced induction or nitrous uh, in, the, in the pipeline. Uh, Project D is asked, does blow-by or oil consumption increase linear to the ring gap being opened up? In other words, is more oil consumption a necessary byproduct product of setting the gap looser? Uh, for example, for a dedicated boosted road racing engine. Uh, I wish I actually had uh, a study to show you. I know that I have seen some data from this and it wasn't absolutely linear, so no. Uh, but I don't have anything more specific to show you there. Uh, I remember uh, seeing uh, a dyno, some uh, results from a dyno test that uh, a very famous engine builder whose name currently escapes me uh, did on some uh, small block Chevy engines and they looked at both the blow by as well as the power uh, across a wide range of ring gaps and uh, it definitely wasn't linear. What we ended up with is very small uh, changes to both power and blow by uh, when we were close to that optimal range of ring end gap and then as we increased the ring gap, or as they increase the ring end gap, uh, we saw sort of a, a, an exponential, I guess, increase in uh, blow by and reduction in power. Uh, 
Donald has asked, is it not advisable to reuse piston rings? Uh, well, really, it depends there on the condition of the rings. Uh, if the rings are in good condition, if there's no uh, no wear showing, if there's no reason to uh, replace them, then generally it's not necessary. However, uh, generally also if we are rebuilding the engine, uh, the piston rings are a component that does wear. If we've got the engine apart, if we've gone to the trouble of uh, machining the engine block, uh, then it's a good idea to replace the rings and make sure uh, that you are replacing a component that will wear out. Uh, Kay Clem has asked, uh, it's my first time gap gapping rings, I started by filing only one side, uh, when compressing the ring in the cylinder I noticed the gap was not parallel, i.e. it was tighter on either the outside diameter or the inside diameter, at this point I filed the other side to get the gap parallel so my feeler blade, blade fit nicely, I'm not sure if this was correct, uh, but have you experienced this and do you ever file a little from each side so that the feeler blade sits nicely? Uh, okay, not strictly the way I normally would would go about uh, setting my ring gaps. Generally I am filing from one side of the ring. Uh, what we will find though is some of the rings that I've dealt with during the manufacturing process what they end up with is essentially uh, almost what I'd refer to as a slight bump or imperfection on one side of the ring end gap. So if we've got a ring like that what we want to do is inspect the ring end gap and we want to see if we do have uh, that sort of situation showing. If that's the case then that is the side of the ring uh, that I'm going to be filing. Uh, so we should be able to adjust one side of the ring end gap in order to make sure that our ring end gap ends up parallel though we shouldn't need to file both. However ultimately if you've got the correct ring end gap and both and your uh, rings are filed, your ring ends are parallel uh, then there's really nothing detrimental to doing what you've done. Uh, Rocky Boyst has asked do the rings not spin and change the location of the gaps placement once you open the motor are the gap locations still placed where they were so now I've covered that over um, you uh, you will find that these rings will rotate in operation. If I remember correctly, uh, they, the general guide is that they can rotate at something in the region of about uh, a tenth of the engine RPM, just to give you a bit of a guide. So uh, no, they will rotate, and uh, of course the rings don't necessarily rotate at perfectly the same rate. So uh, it's likely that when we do uh, disassemble the engine that uh, we may find that sometimes the ring end gaps actually end up lining up. But uh, the general idea is that we are at least going to align those ring end gaps initially for that first startup, and then obviously we've got no control over what's happening to the rings in operation. Uh, Andrew Rasmussen has asked, uh, you stated that too tight of a ring gap uh, can cause the ring lands to fail, why is that? Okay so essentially what we end up with is the ring expanding so much that it seizes in the bore. Uh, so then we've got a situation where uh, the ring is basically holding the crown of the piston up and the conrod is trying to pull uh, the wrist pin out from the underside of the piston. Uh, so this can result in a range of failures. One of the uh, common ones is that it will break the ring land uh, on the top of the piston so it will actually allow the, the ring essentially to pull out of the top of the piston or at least make enough room so that it can uh, crush back down and allow the uh, engine to continue operating. And the other, one, the other mode of failure uh, in a really severe circumstance is where either the entire crown of the piston is ripped off uh, or alternatively the wrist pin is ripped out of the uh, base of the piston. That was just a taste of what we put on every week for our HPA Gold members. We've currently got over 240 hours of existing webinar content covering topics on engine building, engine tuning and wiring. Click the link in the description to learn more.